I'm ready to go. Uh, this is an interview with Mike Trotter on June 9th, 2009 in the offices of Taylor English and Duma. And be interested to know about your family's background and sort of the family values you got from your family and, and sort, of, sort of the road that got you to be so civically engaged. Um, my mother was Nell Hamilton Trotter, and she was from a little town in western Arkansas. It was basically a ghost town. And she had met my father, Richard Trotter, at the University of Wisconsin, where she went to get a master's degree in political science in the mid to late uh, 1920s. And my dad was a, a mechanical engineer and teaching at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he got an offer to come to Georgia Tech in 1930, and that uh, brought them both to Atlanta. And uh, as you know, my mother uh, went to work at Georgia State. Uh, she went down to interview Dr. Sparks and was told that they didn't hire women. Uh, and then the next year she saw something in the newspaper that said that they had hired a woman. So she popped back down to see Dr. Sparks and got hired. Uh, to, to teach some course in home economics, I think, which we all thought was pretty funny in, his, in retrospect because my mother could not pour a good Coca-Cola. She was not a cook. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> but she took what was available. Uh, and I would have to say, I think, that my mother was the strongest influence with respect to civic matters. My uh, dad was... Um, was, of course, a very academic and was very much committed to his students and his courses at Georgia Tech, which was a small but thriving institution in those days. Uh, he was very shy, and he didn't hear very well. He had to wear a hearing aid, so that he wasn't very sociable and didn't get involved with the community. But Mother was in everything that a woman could be in, I think, at one time or another, from her sorority group in Atlanta to the American Association of University Women uh, to the Atlanta League of Women Voters. And she was in the league. She okay. was in the league. With and Frances Pauley and... Well, uh, there was a woman named Helen Bullard. And, yeah, um, sure. and Helen Absolutely. Bullard was was very active, was a political dynamo, dominant dynamo. Dynamo. <laughs> yeah, she ran uh, Ivan Allen's campaigns oh, yeah. for mayor, for instance, and she and Mother were very close friends. Well, Helen Bullard is one of these figures who has almost vanished, except was extremely important at a particular time in Atlanta's mm -hmm. history. Yeah. Yeah. So, so she was good friends with Miss Bullard. She was, and uh, her service was recognized. She was Atlanta's Woman of the Year in Education, right. and then of the Woman, the Woman of the Year, I guess, in 1961. I think it was. Um, and I guess it's just <clears throat> something I came naturally by. I, um, for some reason, I started getting elected president of my class in grade school. I think it, uh, I, I always attributed it to the fact that I was shy and I probably wouldn't tell on the boys who spoke in the bathroom, which was against the rules in the elementary Clark Howell School in Atlanta. Where was Clark Howell? Clark Howe was on 10th Street between Juniper and Piedmont. Mm -hmm. It's a fire station there now. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, went to Grady. Um, I guess the uh, most important thing was going out for the football team. Uh, we went to all the Georgia Tech games. My dad had excellent tickets, and uh, football was a big thing. Were you there the year that Irk Russell coached the Grady? Irk, Irk Russell was, uh, we had a fellow named, who was a math teacher for the first year, and then Speck Landrum came, who ended up, I guess, at Georgia Tech after Auburn, and then Coach Russell took his place, and of course we did win the White State Championship That's right. at the highest level in 19, fall of 1953. I was co-captain of the team. And uh, I had gotten elected president of my class in the sophomore year when my good friend Paul Cleveland flunked Latin, and he'd been the president in the ninth grade. He couldn't run because he'd failed the course, and I somehow got to, became his successor. 
So, I don't know, I just did it. I can't really tell you why. And uh, when I went to Brown, I w was elected the president of my class in the freshman year. Again, as a, pro a product, I think, of the fact that I was on the football team, therefore I knew a lot of people that way. I was from the South, and there were very few people from the South. I could not open my mouth without someone saying, in what part of the South are you from? And I remember an economics professor saying, Mr. Trotter, would you mind speaking more distinctly? I cannot understand a word you are trying to say. <laughs> so, and I, I was the only student in my class who had been admitted to Harvard. And in those days, Brown was not quite as high up on the scale as it was. And I think the fact that I had been admitted to Harvard and had come to Brown was a big boost for me. And I was sort of known for that, <laughs> strange as it may seem at this point. And I was president of my class there for three years, and then I became president of the student body. And um, went on to graduate school in history I saw that, at, yeah. at Harvard, was in the PhD program, and was uh, a Woodrow Wilson fellow. Studying and what and with whom? American history. With Oscar Hanlon? Or Oscar Hanlon. Perry Miller? Or uh, Paul Buck, mm -hmm. uh, intellectual history with mm -hmm. Stuart Hughes, and uh, who was the other famous fellow? In any event, uh, Oscar Hanlon was fabulous. He was the, really the, the best one in the bunch in my exposure. And I had a seminar with Paul Buck, who was, uh, wrote The Road to Reunion, yeah, yeah. was a university professor. And he's basically one of the things that taught me out of being a university professor. Which um, is another issue, I guess. And. Uh, I had a seminar in oceanic history from a guy named Robert Greenhall Albion, I think his name was, a great oceanic historian. Hmm. They used to have those. Uh, I had friends at the law school. I found that I liked, uh, they invited me to their classes and so forth. And I liked what they were doing. I was intimidated by going in the Widener Library and looking down those aisles that looked like they stretched to eternity that were lined with PhD theses. And I thought, is that what I'm going to, I don't know if I want to do that or not. I applied to the architecture school and also got admitted there. I'd always had a strong interest in it. And I kind of wrestled with it and decided to become a lawyer. So my, um, my third year in law school, I took a year-long seminar in juvenile delinquency from a fellow named Sheldon Gluck, who at the time was the world's leading expert on juvenile delinquency. And uh, he had a theory that you could observe a child in their family setting at the age of five and predict with uh, 85 to 90 percent accuracy whether the child would be a delinquent or not. And he looked for three things. He looked for whether the child was supervised at all, somewhat or a lot, whether the child was disciplined at all, some or a lot, and whether there was any semblance of a cohesive family life, some, none, a lot. And if none, 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 juvenile delinquent, which it simply means a person who's unable to function effectively in society, and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, don't worry about it, and a few in between. And it was a very interesting course. And I wrote my, uh, I had to write a paper, and the paper was on the Georgia Juvenile Court Act. Just sort of an easy target at the time. It was, it had a very primitive act, and... Uh, Which was passed when? Oh, this one dated back into the, probably the late 40s, okay. be my guess. And when I, uh, when I got back to Atlanta and went to work for the Alston firm, uh, I, uh, the fact that I had written this paper was, I had raised the, said, could I get this published? So they said, sure, the Georgia Bar Journal's desperate for stuff. And so uh, they published my paper. Uh, and then I got appointed to the Juvenile Court Committee of the Atlanta Bar Association because of that. And in 1965, Ivan Allen 
uh, set up the Atlanta Commission on Crime and Juvenile Delinquency. Let, let me back up just a minute before I get into that. Sure. And I've actually I've interviewed Judge Bell about that among other things too. So, Good. Um, you came back to Atlanta. Any doubt that you were going to come back here, or, or never? Did you sort of always know that you were going to come back here. No, I really was in love with Atlanta, and my heart beat faster when I got within a hundred miles of it. And it was, um, it was my really had a strong feeling for it. And also, you know, I've heard that the law firms here, and I know there weren't many, and they didn't have very many uh, lawyers working for them. Um, we're sort of looking for, to the Ivy Leagues to bring folks here and so forth. We're, so had you been recruited or sort of what was the sort of the... Yes, I, wa I was. I, um, I, had, um, I had an offer from the, the Sutherland, Asbill, and Bremen, and I had an offer from the Alston firm. I, went, I worked at the Alston firm after my first year in law school, which was fairly unusual. I'd met one of the partners there at a Harvard club meeting. And uh, he followed up with me in um, my first year in law school and invited me over and they offered me a job. And in addition to issues of crime and juvenile justice, what other kinds of activities, pursuits did you get involved with outside of uh, the, the practice? Well, initially, um, initially that was it until the Crime Commission, which was, uh, I think, 65, 66. I, the the question that I'm asking more is sort of what were sort of expectations of younger lawyers to get involved in civic affairs, you know, these kinds of things. I mean, obviously there are people somewhat older, Hamilton Loki, James Mackey, I mean, other people who are civically engaged attorneys or, you know, or John Sibley or, you know, or other people as well. But uh, it was well, just we were we were encouraged to participate and there was... Well, the principal reasons for that was that lawyers were absolutely prohibited from soliciting business from anybody. I mean, you, um, it was a breach of the canons of ethics. You could be disciplined, you could be disbarred if you solicited another lawyer's client. I remember a story Dan Hudson told me, who was one of the senior partners, and he'd been on a civic commission with a friend of his who he'd gone, grown, grown up with. And at, after this thing was all over, he said to his friend, uh, gee, I really enjoyed working with you on this, and I hope we'll have a chance to do something together again. Apparently, the, the friend mentioned it to his lawyer, and the lawyer called Dan that very day and said, now, so-and-so told me that you had said this to him, and of course, if you were attempting to solicit legal business from him, I'm going to have to report you to the Bar Association. And of course, if you were just talking about another civic matter, why, I don't. What was it? Now, oh, well, I was just thinking about civic matters. I wasn't thinking about soliciting his business. But it was really tight. So there were two ways you could develop business. One was you could meet people, demonstrate your capabilities, your analytical skills, your ability to present arguments and make cases in a civic or public environment of some sort. Or you could lecture at a continuing legal education program. But in those days, there were almost no, almost no in-house lawyers. So that the chance you would get hired in Atlanta because you talked at a legal program in Atlanta to Atlanta lawyers was about zero. But if you got on a national program in New York, maybe someone in New York would need a lawyer in Atlanta and in those days, lawyers didn't try to practice everywhere like they do today. Right. They would always get a lawyer in the local environment to, to do the work. Okay. Um, and of course, you come here, you come back here in 62. Ivan Allen's just been elected. School desegregation just occurred the previous fall. The Ford Atlanta campaign is just starting. So maybe describe Atlanta you know, upon your return in 1962. Student sit-ins had been in 60, 61, and then continued in 63, 64. Well, the, the sit-ins were still very much a part of the, uh, of the, of the scene. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, there was a restaurant called Lebs. Mm -hmm. Charlie Lebs, yeah. yeah. Good food over by the Rio Right on the, right on the, the corner there, Forsyth and Broad. And uh, they, they were still getting picketed some, and then I think uh, my recollection is perhaps the Davis Brothers chain of restaurants desegregated, 
And uh, so then the Ku Klux Klan was uh, picketing them. And, and then Herons, too, down the street. Yeah. Clubs, right? Just right. Uh, my wife, who was from Connecticut, was just uh, shocked by the scene of people with, and even though their faces were uncovered in Ku Klux Klan outfits parading on the streets in downtown Atlanta. So now you're away when the sit-ins begin in 1960, you're in law school, and you're graduated from high school the same month as Brown. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about sort of your own evolution and thinking about race up to that point. Well, my, my, because my mother and father both worked, uh, we had uh, domestic help. And uh, we usually had, we had African-American women on the whole who several of whom were college graduates. And I don't know how Mother found them, but she found some really wonderful people, absolutely wonderful people. And she had, there was an African-American man who worked for the post office. All I know is his last name was Walker. And uh, Mr. Walker did jobs for us at the house and was, was really a nice person. And you lived where? I lived on 13th Street, okay. right off West Peach Street, 28 13th Street. Um, in those days, um, between what was called Crescent Avenue, now Peach Street Walk, and I'm sorry, and Columbia Avenue, now Peach Street Walk, mm -hmm. there was an alleyway, and it was a cinder paved alleyway that went through from Columbia to Crescent Street, and there was a little black enclave right. back in there, really shacks, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe four or six, and black families living there. And uh, I remember at one point uh, when I was, I would guess, six or seven, meeting one of the black boys who lived there, and we played together a little bit, and my mother actually, it's unusual, intervened and said that she didn't really think, want me playing with children who she did not know their parents. And... Um, which is the only time she ever did anything that I thought I, I mean, might indicate a bias or might just have been a legitimate concern. I think it really was just that. Uh, so we had these black people we knew, and um, sometimes mother did not have someone to look after me, and she would take me to the uh, home of, there was a family that, from which a couple of these ladies came. Mm -hmm. It was on Linden Street, mm -hmm. just... Um, in Midtown. Yes, um, on the east side of, of uh, Piedmont. And so I went over there and played with their kids, and that was fine. Um, then we had a... Uh, when I was in high school, we had a wonderful lady named Mary Burley, who's still alive, by the way. And uh, uh, when I came home from school, uh, Mary was there, and we always talked and uh, exchanged ideas and had a close relationship. Um, so, and I don't know particularly why, but I felt a sensitivity about the issue. I remember getting on the bus when I was 10 or so, and a person, a very dark-skinned person, who I thought might have been from the Far East, got on the bus and sat up front. And uh, I was very, I don't know, very concerned about the fact that someone might say something to him or be rude to him or demand that he move. In this particular case, no one did. Um, and Grady was a very, uh, Grady High School was a very progressive place. About a third of the students were Jewish. Right. We had, uh, we were the mixing bowl of Atlanta. The number one uh, female student in our class was Greek. The number one, uh, number, the boy who got the award for the most academic was a Chinese. Uh, there was a Chinese laundry at 10th Street run by the Chews, and Ming Chu was in the class ahead of me, and was cadet colonel of the ROTC, and so forth. Uh, so, 
Um, I've had other people tell me about Grady and its influence on them too. You know, just yeah, made it, them kind of think about things a, diff- a little bit differently. You know. uh, and I think I hadn't been able to find it, but I thought that the Southerner, which was the school paper, mm-hmm. ran an article before the Brown case uh, of talking to because the Brown case was about to come out and there was much speculation about it talking to students about how they felt about it and I virtually all the students said though they thought segregation was wrong and uh, it ought to be remedied. I could tell you probably who could locate that article it's the current social studies chair at Grady, he's a former student of mine who wrote his master's thesis on Superintendent Letson and he uh-huh. knows about this stuff a lot so yep. uh, he probably would be able to dredge up that well, I might want to follow up with okay. him on that uh, when I got to Brown, uh, there were three, I believe, three African Americans in my class. One from Atlanta, a man named Joel Caruth Stokes. Oh, who? There's just not okay. And Joel was um, Lorimer Milton, who was the chairman of the Citizens Trust Bank, was sure. a Brown graduate. L.D. Milton, sure. As was John Hope, right? Yeah. Yes, as was John Hope, and. Uh, Mr. Milton arranged for Joel to go to Deerfield Academy and then go to Brown. And we ran against one another for the presidency of the freshman class. And I won. Uh, But uh, we became friends. And I um, put him on our class council. And I found out very quickly that he was one of the most reliable and effective members of the class council. If you ask him to do something, it got done. You ask most of the other folks, it didn't, without a lot of pushing and shoving. And I also remember that uh, Brown gave you a writing test to determine whether you could um, write well enough, and you had to pick a topic and write on it. One of the topics had something to do with race, and I wrote on that topic, and I remember saying that the, the South really had to deal with the problem because it the white community was carrying the black community on its back. We were holding these people back, but we were having to help support them and feed them and educate them, and they needed to be able to do it themselves. And where that came from, I just, I don't know. I just felt that way about it. So um, that's, I guess, my background on the racial side. Okay, so... Obviously sympathetic, and then you know, I had black friends, and and we're watching the student sit-ins in '60 and '61 from afar. Any respo- Any re- recollections of that? Well, not not really, uh, because we I didn't get a local paper, and it um, we had sit-ins in Cambridge. My wife sat in at the Woolworths in Cambridge. <laughs> she was a student at Wellesley. And uh, it um, was really more, a little more focused on that. We did follow the desegre- I did follow the desegregation of the Atlanta public schools. Of course, Grady was one of the first schools right. desegregated, and was intensely concerned about it. Got to ask questions about it. Uh, all the Yankees were assumed everybody from the South was a uh, died in the wool seg, and uh, so you had uh, constant. Dialogue, and I guess you got tired of defending it, but you felt felt I felt obligated to defend it. And said we weren't all that white, we weren't all segregationist. And of course, President Kennedy started his uh, press conference that day of the school desegregation, talking about Hartsfield and Vander and the Atlanta public schools and so forth. Yeah, and for certain, certainly people of a certain generation, that was one of their proudest moments. I gather, you know, talking to people like George Goodwin or people like that. Mm-hmm. You know, they were very. I remember right. being at home that summer and uh, during the mayor's race and going out to Lenox Square to the auditorium there for a presentation by the candidates for mayor mm-hmm. and that uh, Mayor Allen and I, I guess uh, Lester Maddox was running against him. Muggsy Smith as well, but yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I was on Mayor Allen's side. Um, do you remember... Sort of thoughts about 
not only Lester, but his constituents uh, at that point. And of course, this is prior to the Civil Rights Act and so forth, but he's yeah. very much outspoken, even by 61 and 60 and so forth. Well, I was really appalled by Lester Maddox. And uh, remember, uh, Sue and I went to a Georgia Tech football game. We went to the varsity before the game, and Lester Maddox was in the there trying shaking hands with people, and we refused to shake hands with him. It was very early, late on, because women weren't often in varsity, as you know, until the mid six, early 60s. I, again, I just was trying to get a sense, both of your own personal evolution, but also just a, sort of a snapshot of Atlanta, 1962, mm -hmm. 1963, in that, in that era, era coming in. Um, within the Bar Association, uh, who were some of the people who kind of showed you the ropes, and it also sounds as if there were a lot of people roughly your age, your peers, coming into the bar, to the young lawyers and so forth. Uh, so maybe you sort of flush that picture out a bit. Well, the Alston firm had 15 lawyers, and right. uh, Philip Alston was a major figure in the community, and there was a fellow there named John Moore who had uh, recruited me, he was a Harvard College, Harvard Law School graduate, who ultimately was a Chairman and President of the Export Import Bank and the, the uh, Carter administration. Right. And uh, uh, Frank Shackelford, who was one of the senior partners, was also very interested in civic things, and he became the general counsel for the Atlanta Commission right. on Crime and Juvenile Delinquency and picked the young lawyers who were the volunteer counsel. And I was the counsel for the Juvenile Delinquency Committee because of my paper and work in juvenile right. delinquency, and Emmett Bundrant was on that group. Clay Long was in Had you known group. Emmett before then? Or? Yeah, Emmett was at Harvard my last year. He graduated from Georgia, but then came and had an a extra year in the master's program at Harvard. Okay. And, and was he also from Atlanta originally? He was from Athens. Okay. But there were so few Southerners. There was a Southern, Southern club at the Harvard Law School and all the Southerners were members of it, and so you knew one another. Well, I knew that you and Emmett went way back, and I didn't know sort of how far back, but yeah. I went to law school. Okay. Yeah, back, back that long. And uh, Clay Long was in my class at law school. Also a fellow named Jonathan Golden, who you probably have run into, from Arnold Golden and Gregory. Right. His father started that firm. Um, and then there were several other of our classmates who came here from there. Um, yeah, I've talked with another generation of lawyers who were at the World War II vets. Griffin Bell, Ernest Vandiver, you know, uh, Sanders, I guess, at the end, end of that group, and Mackey and others, and just talking about sort of coming back home after the war and having their horizons expanded and really hitting the ground running and getting involved in politics and civic life and so forth. And it sounds to me that we have sort of another cohort of young lawyers kind of <coughs> coming on the scene in the early 60s, you know, at another sort of period of ferment and change and so forth as well. Well, we, we, we really did. Um, and we, we, lawyers didn't have to work, for the most part, nearly as hard as they do today, put in as many billable hours. So I, I wrote a book called yeah, Profit and Practice it, yeah. of Law, which deals with all that. So you, you had time to spend, and you were encouraged to spend time on community matters and you um, for instance I did a lot of work with the CNS Bank I got I met Mills Lane when I was the, been at the firm six months perhaps uh, and developed a relationship with Mr. Lane which was very important to me both professionally and civically um, and it would never happen today a young lawyer would never have that kind of exposure Today. That's interesting. And in part, it's because it's a, well, it's just a smaller place. The legal profession was different. The firms were smaller, and, and so all, forth. All, all of that, and the um, the profession, the, the legal work was expanding very rapidly in the '60s, so that there were there weren't enough older lawyers to do the work, and so the only way, and you couldn't hire lawyers from other firms. It just was unthinkable in Atlanta in those days. Right. 
with a few exceptions. Right. Might be somebody from out of town. Right. But um, as a result, we moved up very quickly. And I was doing public offerings for genuine parts company, for instance, before I became a partner. And I became a partner in five years, uh, which was more or less the rule in those days, five or six. And it'd be twice that long today. And then you'd become a non-equity partner, not a real partner. Uh, so you got pushed out into the world and you met people um, very quickly. You know, I, you know, you mentioned Mills Lane, and of course this is the heyday of the so-called power structure, right? You know, oh. uh, And so then as a 20-something or an early 30-something, um, what sort of your observations or you know, take on, on power and decision-making at that time? And I'm sure you've read some of the literature on the power structure. We'll get yeah. back to these matters later on. But, but just kind of, well, you had access to Mills Lane. You were on a committee with Billy Stern. Uh, you know, it seems that, you know... Uh, well, you, the, the Crime Commission, in the year 65, you had, uh, you had Judge Bell as chairman. You had Billy Stern as vice chairman. You had the president of Georgia Power. Uh, you had many of the major leaders in the community, plus you had major people from the African-American community. And the chairman of the, the Juvenile Delinquency Committee was Dr. Williams Home Borders. And uh, he was a wonderful man. And he, um, uh, the president of Georgia Tech, Dr. Harrison, was on that committee. I forgot who the other couple members were, but, I mean, those were the people I was working for at uh, three years out of law school. So it's not only those men making the decisions, but it sounds like there's also bringing younger folks into these circles, or at least intersecting with these circles and so forth. Um, let's ca talk about the Commission on Crime and Juvenile Delinquency, and I'd be interested in sort of what prompted Mayor Allen to appoint it and <clears throat> something about Judge Bell's style and conduct and coordinating that commission and so forth. Uh, I think there had been thought to have been a crime wave in Atlanta, um, and it's one of those periodic things where the press and others got focused on the fact that there was crime, and so Mayor Allen decided to, to try to do something to address it and appointed this commission. Um, uh, Judge Bell had a very broad view of the problem, uh, and he and the other members basically encouraged us to, to take a community, holistic perhaps, view of, of the crime problem. So we looked at poverty, and we looked at uh, schools. We didn't just look at uh, how many murders and how we can catch the people who did them. So we, we really delved into the whole sort of makeup of the community that caused it to give rise to a lot of crime. And Atlanta's always had a lot of crime. Yeah, the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century had a lot of crime. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. It, it's, it's uh, for many years we were number one on the list in terms of... Uh, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, but even, even way back in the early 20th century, it had one yes, of the highest oh, yeah. 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 crime rates. And of course, the, that's a, the people generally attributed that to the fact that blacks were more inclined to, to be criminals. And that was one thing we uh, sought to address and look for other causes that were not racial but um, environmental and uh, cultural that might give rise to that. And I saw, um, well, we'll talk about Judge Bell's sort of Again, his style. I think of him as a very pragmatic kind of guy. There's no, there's no question about that. Nuts and bolts. And there's, all a, the way. there's a story we we'll okay. need to get to about that later about the desegregation of the schools. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah. definitely get to that. Okay. Um, so, and even he encouraged us to do all this, and uh, he um, was wonderful, warm, uh, opening, open, encouraging. You felt like you were. A par, you could speak your mind, you could uh, uh, assert yourself, you, you weren't held down and uh, keep your mouth shut and leave it to the big boys to make the decisions. So uh, 
I think to a very large extent, the lawyers, the young lawyers, all of us who were, Fred Davis was another, Buck Griffin was another, Jerry Luxemburger was and another. And William Alexander. And Bill Alexander, who's an African-American. Who's with the Hall of Fame. Yep. And there, that was a major decision. Frank Shackelford really was sensitive to that issue and raised it with Judge Bell and said, by all means, we ought to add. No, my, my, when I saw that, I was wondering whether that could have happened even five years before. Mm -hmm. You know, that... Um, I, I don't think it could have. You know, that... I mean, yes, there had been the Interracial Commission and Southern Regional Council and so forth, but for a city-appointed commission of this type, I think probably Mayor Allen's sensitivity through the sit-ins, I mean, it seemed to me that that was something that even maybe five or ten years before could not have happened. Yeah. So, yeah, it, uh, and it wasn't a problem for any of us. Um, one of the, my committee recommended the establishment of something called the Atlanta Children and Youth Services Council. There's a really pattern on a similar organization in New York. I think I, I think I went to New York and met with them and I remember writing it up. And that was another important step for me because I was appointed to it as secretary. A fellow named Bob Wood, who was the general attorney for Sears Roebuck in the Southeast, was the chairman. And Bob was very influential. He was chairman of Judge of uh, Mayor Allen's uh, bond commission for the big bond offering that failed. And his brother was president of Sears. Oh, if General I Wood, correctly. right? Robert E. Lee Wood, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh. And uh, Bob, uh, the vice chairman was Franklin Thomas mm -hmm. of the Butler Street YMCA. Oh, yeah. And Margaret Perdue was the, uh, I guess Margaret was the treasurer, and I was the secretary. I don't know Margaret. Well, she was the wife of Rhodes Purdue, who uh, Haverty Furniture, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, Margaret was very active in community affairs in Atlanta for okay. a long period. And of time. Franklin Thomas was also a member of this commission. He w he was the vice chairman. Okay. And the um, and there were a number of other African Americans on it. And the uh, we had to pick a, an executive director. And we, uh, Mayor Allen was very anxious to get it up and running, so he appointed Mrs. Grace Hamilton as the temporary interim executive director so that we could then conduct the search. And we, uh, we conducted a search, and we uh, hired John Cox. Also from Butler Street Y. Well, or not. No, he, well, no. John was actually. I think at that time he was running a settlement house in Cleveland. Okay. He was from I think East Point, mm -hmm. and he had grown up in the Butler Line, right? Line right. And uh, might have worked there before, and he worked for the Department of Labor for a while in the Kennedy administration. Well, Mrs. Hamilton didn't want to give the job up, and she started uh, lobbying the. The, and Franklin sided with hiring John because that was the right thing to do. I mean, there wasn't any question about it. Ms. Hamilton was too occupied with her own uh, job at the legislature. Right. To, uh, so this is after she'd been elected. So we're talking yeah. 66 by this yeah. time. Okay. Right. And uh, and I really admired Franklin because Ms. Ms. Hamilton worked very hard on the board of Butler Y to basically force Franklin to make a racial issue out of it. And Franklin Thomas wouldn't do that. He was a great man. Um, I've heard other people talk about him. Um, yeah. George Goodwin, for instance, talked about him. Yeah, I was a great, great admirer of Franklin's. In any event, that Franklin uh, then had me appointed, elected to the board of the Butler Street YMCA. And um, for a long period of time, I was the only white member. Uh, Zena Sears mm -hmm. was Daddy, also Daddy a Sears. member. Daddy Sears, you like rhythm, blues, and the jive. Daddy Sears will keep you alive. <clears throat> and the Piano Red Show, following the Piano Red Show. <laughs> um, and he didn't come very often. So uh, I was often the only white person there. And after a while, I think they sort of forgot I was there. And it was very interesting to see the differences in point of view and people letting their hair down about what, what they really thought was going on. 
<clears throat> and then about 19, sometime around 66 or 67, I got a call one day to come to Mills Lane's office. And I got there, and uh, he had his office on the first floor, the main banking floor of the CNS building at uh, Five Points, which is interesting itself on Broad Street. And I, Mayor Allen and Philip Olson were there. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Lane said that uh, uh, there was a waiting list of thousands of people for the Atlanta Housing Authority, and the city didn't have the resources to respond but that a new law had been passed in Congress that permitted the creation of nonprofit sponsors for federally financed housing, 221D3. And he wanted, they wanted me to uh, undertake to find out how that housing could be built and to arrange to have some of it built. Uh, and uh, so I studied the, the legal aspects of it. I remember calling the fellow, his last name was Young, who was with the Southern uh, Regional Southern Church. Christian Leadership Conference. Okay. And uh, his attitude was, well, you guys just give us the money and we'll do the job. And uh, Philip Alston was the <clears throat> director of a couple of foundations. One of them was the... Um, Master Woolley Foundation, and uh, as we started trying to find a sponsor for our project and not liking the response we got from the Southern Regional Southern Christian, Southern Leadership. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, right, thank you, uh, I thought of the Butler Y, and uh, the Butler Y was all for it. And uh, it seemed like a great idea. Uh, this thing would be paid off by rents and the mortgage would be paid off and Butler Y would own it, would have a major asset. Uh, and they set up a Butler Y Homes and uh, Bill Calloway and Fletcher Coombs and I, I think, were the directors of Butler Y Homes. And we then built the Butler Y Homes on James Jackson Parkway. Oh, wow, out in Northwest Atlanta. Out in Northwest Atlanta. And uh, it, we got it wrapped up with the Y, and we uh, decided we needed a branch YMCA for the Northwest branch. And uh, I recruited Horace Sibley uh, into this effort, and Horace uh, sort of led the effort and got very involved in the Y himself. And so we built a Branch Y, and we built the Butler Y Homes. Uh, on the, and that about after the Crime Commission was for essentially one year, and we put out a report. And it seemed to me that we had developed a lot of contacts in the community, that's the staff of the Commission. And we knew the people in the media, and we were, had educated ourselves about the community problems. And so I called a meeting at the Davis Brothers Restaurant and said, uh, of all the staff members, and said, we ought to create uh, a government Atlanta and uh, use what we've learned and the relationships and the ties we've got to uh, try to improve the community. And uh, most of the f members of the group s said, yes, let's do that. And Clay Long initially bowed out. And uh, Hugh Peterson, who was the Deputy General Counsel of King Spalding, opted out. And one of the first things we did, I guess Emmett and I really were the, the primary leaders of it, went to see Gene Patterson and he dusted us off, said, uh, ah, it's, you know, it's important people like me in this community who get things done, and you guys can't have any effect. Well, yeah, keep on that story, and I want to follow. And uh, then we went to see Jack Spaulding, and Jack Spaulding was very encouraging. He said, absolutely wonderful, do this. And so we decided we'd release our reports on the journal's time. And, you know, if you hit at a particular hour of the day, it went in the journal before it went in the Constitution. 
And it was one of the happiest days of my life when after about a year, Gene Patterson called me up one day and said, couldn't you release some of these on the Constitution style? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what role the media is playing in all of this because you know, you, in the thing that you wrote on Good Government Atlanta, uh, you know, you talked about how you had very favorable relations with the media and uh, you mentioned this story also in there. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, what part you know, the media is often seen as very closely connected with the power structure and with the, all of the Allen administration, you know, at the state house with the Sanders administration, you know, uh, uh, and maybe your observations of sort of how the media worked at that time and McGill and Tarver as well as Spalding and Patterson and, and other figures of the day and some of the some of the reporters as well. Well. Um they would tell you, of course, that they uh, uh, were impartial and that they uh, didn't get actively involved in a lot of this stuff. I, uh, I had a personal experience. I was about to leave on vacation. My wife was driving, waiting for me with the kids in the back of the station wagon. It was probably 1970. And the phone rang in my office just as I was leaving, and I started to let it go, but I went back and answered it, and I thought I heard the voice say, uh, Oh, Mike, this is Bill Zane. And I said to myself, Who the hell is Bill Zane? <clears throat> and then the man spoke again. I realized it was Mills Lane. <laughs> and he said he was having lunch with Jack Tarver and Mayor Allen at the Commerce Club, and they'd like to talk to me. So I ran downstairs. I waved down my wife, said, I've got to drive around the block. I've got to go over here. And they said, uh, well, we'd like for you to run for the county commission. And uh, uh, Jack, the newspapers will endorse you. And uh, Mayor Allen and I will help raise the money. And uh, we'd like for you to do it. And I said, well, I had to talk to the firm and so forth. And we were about to leave for Connecticut. And uh, uh, Mr. Lane said, well, if you... Uh, Qualifications close on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, and you have to qualify in person, but we'll send the CNS plane up to fly you back if you decide you'd like to do it, and we hope you will. So I ran back across to fellow Boston, and of course he kind of dumped water on me. He said, can you carry water on both shoulders? And uh, so I then ran back, well, I guess, I don't know, I put the sequence of this, but I went back and forth two or three times, finally got in the car, drove off. My I was steaming, of course, kids hollering in the back. And uh, she was not enthusiastic about it. She said, you know, you're going to run for a public office with your second wife, and if you try to divorce me, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close, yeah. So I decided not to do it. But it was all this business about the newspapers don't take sides or they just stand back and wait for the person, people to qualify and then decide who the best candidate is. That's at least one example where it obviously wasn't the case. They had great political reporters at that time. I mean, I, I'm thinking Ship, but then Jack Nelson and a little bit before. Or or Alex Coffin, do you remember that yeah, name? Celestine Sibley. And, um, uh, yeah, um, well, she lived two houses down the street from us on 13th Street, by the way. They knew Sibley for a very long while. And uh, Raleigh Bryan, mm -hmm. yeah, Raleigh Bryan, and um, the, I'm just blanking on the name of the fellow from the Journal too. Uh, uh, it starts with a P, also, but I'm just uh, not re yeah. remembering his name. So either we took the Constitution. Any event, it it uh, they really obviously did have had a big role. They had a big stake in the prosperity and success of the community, and were I think very public spirited. <laughs> Um, and generally we're on the right side of the equation. It's very, I think it's very helpful to Atlanta to have that quality now, press. When you came with this proposal for good government in Atlanta, did you have any models from any other places, any other communities? Or We had looked around a bit, um, and in most, most such organizations were made up of people at the top, of the community in either civic or business leadership jobs instead of at the bottom where basically we were. Um, 
how we do thought you, there was a how, void. How do, you, how do you figure that you were at the bottom? Well, we were very young. Yeah. We had just um, been out of school three or four years. Um, no, just thought it was uh, worth doing. And I think, I think we felt that the knowledge was very powerful and that we had been able to do a good analysis and presentation of uh, issues and that, that there were many others that needed to be addressed and why and we thought so and Emmett and I were both full of ideas but the other fellows had, had them too. Also it seems to me, and again correct me if I'm wrong, that sort of Atlanta's sort of fertile soil at that time for something absolutely. like Absolutely. That. Now that's absolutely correct. I mean if I'm thinking you know, relatively peaceful desegregation and Mayor Ivan Allen well known in Washington and of course Major League Sports coming here, the skyscrapers, you know, downtown revitalizing and you know, the scene you know, the sixties are a great growth period in in so many ways here and, and uh, so there's a sort of a spirit of optimism at that time. That's 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 absolutely correct. And we were very proud of our of our town and we had all the virtually all of the lawyers in that group had been away to school in the north, I guess, for the most part. So you have the advantages of both being homegrown and seeing a little bit more of the world and coming back. And but, uh, I don't know. I certainly had a feeling of being uh, unappreciated and discriminated against by the north. That uh, people thought we were all hayseeds and uh, were not to be taken seriously about anything and that was offensive and we were I was anxious and I think I think the other fellows were anxious to build Atlanta up and to prove that we were a civilized uh, thoughtful progressive community and when I think of other people who are around at that time who are in government who are public administrators and so forth I mean Dan Sweat's cutting his teeth with Ivan Allen and and Charlie Emmerich in DeKalb County. And George Berry. George Berry. Uh, Charlie Davis in the Finance Department. Yeah. Um, there are yeah. a bunch of like really capable civil servants, you know, uh, public administrators who are also involved in the mix as well. Absolutely. Any others that come to mind? I mean, well, you know, I remember the we. Um, we did a uh, study of the uh, way the county, Fulton County, taxed the right. city and spent the money outside. And we, uh, I've forgotten the name of the man who was the controller of the county. He was a mm -hmm. mature gentleman, mm -hmm. John something. Okay. Right? And uh, we, we, he either wrote a letter to the editor or word got back to us that he was very critical of our report and so we called him up and said we'd like to come talk to you and we went down and met with him for a couple of hours and he said when we were finished this is one of the most enlightening uh, meetings I've ever had in public office and he changed his tune so it was very uh, powerful stuff I mean you really got motivated when you found that you could could make a difference yeah. I know that was one of your first reports, Big League City with Little League Taxes. Uh, um, and it seemed to me that that continues a conversation that goes at least back to the plan of improvement days and mm -hmm. so forth. And so I was wondering, you know, were there any of the veterans of that effort, of the effort to annex parts of Atlanta and the coordination of services between the county and the city and people like Philip Hammer or others who had been involved in the planning process for the plan of improvement? Well, Philip Hammer was certainly a, still a force in the community, and I, while well, he did not, we met with him, I'm pretty sure, and I remember he gave, going to some talks he had, he made about community issues. And of course, Jerry Horton was, was on the scene and had worked for Charlie Weltner and then had gone out and had his own business, and I remember going to some of the programs that Jerry 
uh, presented on housing and other issues in the in Atlanta. So there was a general ferment. It wasn't just us by any means. There were a number of different players, and of course, the urban renewal was a very uh, obvious big thing topic. And then we got the mart up pretty quickly. Let's talk about urban renewal. Um, the Civic Center, Bedford Pines, is obviously the big yep. one. The stadium, another yep. big one. Um, what was your feeling, either your personal feeling or the folks you were with or Good Government Atlanta, feeling about the whole process of ur urban renewal? At the time, I don't think that was a topic that we were focused on. I think um, I probably th thought it was a uh, basically a good thing until we started seeing some of the feedback. You may recall the riots down the liquor store down near the stadium site. Yeah, or Ivan Allen was on the police car. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you saw that the uh, we were wrecking the community that was a community to people in the city who were black, and that it. Uh, we needed to be thinking twice about what we were doing and so, was benefiting from it. So would you say your thoughts have evolved concerning urban renewal? And I'm linking this to your later comments about public housing, the city being just filled, you know, with poor folks and, you know, these writings that you've written over the years about the, you know, crime and housing and <clears throat> other schools and other kinds of related issues, but, um, did urban renewal, in your opinion, contribute to some of these problems of the city that you later describe, in, you know, in particular regarding housing and crime? Um, you know, I don't know the relationship between the public, the additional public housing that was built and the urban renewal, whether there was a quid pro quo there. Well, I mean, I was talking more about yeah. the people displaced. Where did they end up? and what kind of situation did they end up in and so forth. And it seems that many of them, no doubt, ended up in public housing projects. And that probably is part of the pressure to build the public housing. Because I, I, the figure I think I remember Mayor Allen saying at that meeting in Mr. Lane's office was 6,000 families or 6,000 people on the waiting list. And that, I, I never th couple those, put those two together, but it might well have been because of the uh, urban renewal in part. At least in part. You yeah. know, it seems to, I mean, it seems to me that urban renewal is just sort of jumping out there as a, a to topic for us to now rethink about and reconsider and, and so forth historically. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting, this whole debate over the property tax and who got the benefits and so forth in terms of more recent developments with the secession movements and the new communities forming up, you know, and the Sandy Springs becoming its own community and, you know, all these other places. So I'd be curious, looking back from a 40-year perspective, sort of how you think about that effort and how it's played out then over the last, uh, over the subsequent 40 years. Property tax is a very complex subject. It's um, most people just think about the tax on their home, and they don't realize that homes make up a relatively small percentage of the total property tax base. At least they did in those days, and I assume they still do today. And that most of the tax is borne by commercial property, and commercial property is is uh, discriminated against through the homestead exemption, among other things. Um, and it really gets back to what it costs to maintain a run a government. And we all wish that we didn't have to pay for what we got. We all like to think that there'd be some easy way to fix it and make it more cost effective and efficient so that we didn't have to pay as much and got better services in the bargain. Atlanta's property taxes are very high. The, um, I believe they're higher than the property taxes in New York City. Uh, 
New York Times runs periodically, a section on properties that are sold and the taxes on the properties and as a percentage of fair market value, they are lower than the property taxes here. Now, they have a ton of other taxes, there's no doubt about it. The tax burden overall is higher. But on the property tax side, we're, we're very high. And it's, um, there are the ongoing disputes about alternative sources of income and about more efficient services. And it's, um, it seems that the situation now is so different though than the situation in 1963 in terms of where the population is in the metro area oh, yeah. and you know, just so the explosion of the suburbs hadn't really taken place. So that's true. Your report at that time could have more sort of oomph in a sense, you know, from a city perspective, you know, and, and you could get the ear of the comptroller for the county and, and yep. you know, in a way that might be more difficult politically now. They'd, they'd probably be very difficult. Along with urban renewal, the other thing that I wanted to kind of talk about in terms of demographics and housing in the 1960s is the issue of white flight. And to what degree, I mean, obviously you're dealing with it in part vis-a-vis -vis the schools, although that it seems that that's toward the end of the decade. So I'm, I'm curious as to sort of your and again, I'm speaking your broadly, not only your personal awareness, but the group, Good Government Atlanta, et cetera, the circles, sort of awareness of the issue and sort of thoughts about it and how you considered and, and addressed the whole issue of white flight at the time. I uh, ran across the other day a paper I wrote on that subject in 19, I think 1969. Um, so Atlanta the next 10 years and it uh, it basically deals with that issue what did you say um, and I've said to uh, and Phil Boston gave a copy of this to Mr. Lane and Mr. Lane came up to my office and congratulated me on it I was really quite taken back he didn't often do that mm -hmm. Um, and the first conclusion was Atlanta will either be a truly integrated city or a black city. The Atlanta power structure must take a firm position to actively support integration if Atlanta is to survive as other than a black city. Uh, and so on. So, I mean, the question then is obviously you had very good contacts across racial lines with your counterparts in the black community, however you would describe them, with uh, the Bill Alexanders or the Fletcher Coombses or the John Coxes of the world. But maybe not so much communication with um, the folks who were leaving, the white folks who were leaving the city. No, def definitely not. We really didn't have any ties to southwest Atlanta, for instance, mm -hmm. Cascade area at all. Kirkwood. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, it's of course hindsight, but it, you know, if you look at it sort of in hindsight, you know, were there places along the way where alternatives might have been, mm -hmm. you know, at least publicly addressed, or was it something that was so kind of in, in, intransigent or so, you know, had a momentum of its own that nothing could have stopped that? I really don't know the answer. Because the rapidity is something that's striking. You yeah. know, just, um, you know, when certain schools flip the neighborhood flips like that, you know, and, and just, again, in Mosley Park or Kirkwood or different neighborhoods, you cascade, you know, where the change, you know, occurs almost sometimes within a week yeah. or a month or something like that. So, uh, and then so by the end of the 60s, obviously, because of the changing demographics, that affects sort of issues concerning desegregation and the various plans that are put forth and so on. Um, we had an interesting uh, little event on the north side involving that. Uh, Franklin Thomas bought a home on the north side of Atlanta. The name of it will come back to me. It's a street out near Lenox. Uh, 
Okay. And, and um, this was shortly after the Action Forum had been formed, and so it had been 73 perhaps, and the, um, all of a sudden that virtually every house on the block in both directions went up for sale. And um, we talked about it in an Action Forum meeting, and um, I said, we really have got to get a, some white person to buy one of those houses quick. And uh, Mr. Lane agreed to make a loan. That's very interesting. And I recruited a um, young lawyer, younger lawyer in the firm to buy the house next to Franklin. And um, he was a public spirited guy and uh, he put in a bid for it and uh, at that point someone else who was white bought it and all the signs came down. A little intervention goes a long way. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it's also interesting that this phenomenon even touched your circles too. You know, I mean, you know, Franklin and, you know, yeah, and Lennox it, it Grand was. neighborhood. And, it was. Huh. Um, Were you, you, did you, just, this is parenthetical, I guess. Were you in attendance at King's Nobel Award dinner? No. At, I guess it was at the uh, Dinkler or wherever it was. No, here. Didn't, didn't get invited and never met Dr. King. Never met Dr. King. He was really, you know, away. Yeah, I mean, he's a he, national figure much more he than He was that. very much a low-profile figure in Atlanta after the initial sit-ins. Um, you mentioned in one of these writings that the 1969 mayor's race was good government Atlanta's finest hour. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Well, it really wasn't the mayor's race. It was the city council right. and school board races. Right. And we, um, and along with this line of thinking that we really needed to have an integrated city and we needed to have good black leadership come forward and good leadership, period. Mm -hmm. Uh, we decided that we would um, uh, try to recruit good candidates for the city council and for the school board. And we, I gave a speech to the Resurgence Club on the fact that there were plenty of good black people out there who could serve and sh should serve. And I was on the Chambers Education Committee and a fellow named Frank Smith, who was with IBM, was chairman of it. and we decided we would try to, uh, he had tried to help some, and we went out, Frank and I went to see Dr. Mays at his home to ask him to run for the school board. And his wife was quite ill and died uh, soon thereafter, and he was finishing a book, and he said, you yeah, know, I can't do it. We made our best case, and he told us he was sorry, but he couldn't do it. About three weeks later, he called, Dr. Dr. Mays called me at the office and he said, uh, uh, if I were to change my mind, do you believe I would be able to raise enough money to run a campaign and uh, whether I could get the endorsement of the Atlanta newspapers? And I responded affirmatively to both and he said, well, I'd like to come down and talk to you about it which he did, and I had already talked to Philip Walston about it, and so I was able to take Dr. Mays in to meet Philip, and Philip gave Dr. Mays a check that covered his entire qualification fee to the race. And I'd called Reg Murphy and Jack Spaulding, and Reg Murphy had said, I can't, we can't commit to a candidate in advance the qualification, but I can, can tell you that I can't imagine a better candidate than Dr. Mays. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Mays obviously had been talking in the black community as well, and I think received encouragement there to run, and he offered, he, he ran, of course, was elected. Um, somewhere along the lines, and it may have been John Cox, told us that we needed to meet with a group called Young Men on the Go. Yeah, he made a mention of that. Yep. And we went out to a black fraternity house on Gordon Road and uh, 
there's Lonnie King and Charles Black and John Cox and Marvin, I guess, was probably there, Marvin Arrington. <clears throat> and uh, this, I may have covered this. I, they said, uh, you know, well, if you'll support these black candidates, we'll support these white candidates. And we said, that's not the deal. We're supporting the best candidates, regardless of their race. And we're going to support your these black candidates who we think are good candidates, whether you support ours or not. But we hope you'll support ours, too. So what was Lonnie's reaction or Charles's reaction? Or well, they were rather taken back, I think. <laughs> and, and, you know, and again, they're okay. they're a slightly different generation than you are, even. Although you mentioned well, young men on the go, this is they, so Lonnie's year. Lonnie's was a bit maybe, older, yeah, because he had been in the old. Navy before he went to yeah, Morehouse, right? Yeah, a year or two older. He's still a good friend. Um, Do you know he's getting a PhD in history? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. I was sent one of his uh, it was one of his references okay. for that. Um, in the event, we uh, we elected some very good people to the school board to the, both the school board and the board of Alderman. and the board of Alderman. Well, Let me talk about. I mean, I saw the list. Or helped uh, Wade Mitchell and Mitch Fowler, uh, Maynard as vice mayor. Uh, Marvin Arrington and Ira Jackson. Yep. And so let me talk about yeah. Ira Tom, Jackson. Tom Beebe, Marvin, right. yeah. Um, Ira Jackson caught my name, of course, yeah. because for a long time I thought he was an exemplary Board of Aldermen and then got caught up in scandal. So I just, yeah. just if you could reflect a bit on sort of the trajectory of Ira Jackson in particular. Well, it's, it's a sad thing. And by the way, Joel Stokes had the same problem. And it's equally sad. Um, and I, I don't uh, don't know how to explain it other than the temptation and opportunity. Um, and um, I don't know. Ira was an exemplary guy. I mean, I always felt he he could count, and add things up, and sort of was doing what a board of aldermen, a city council person, should be doing. Yeah. Really attending to business and taking it seriously, and so and forth. he worked. He was smart. He worked hard. He worked very hard to get what he had. He made his his uh, economic success by hard work and by uh, smarts. And uh, I'm sort of as an exemplary city council person too, you know, just you know attending he, to business. And he that. absolutely was. And then I think temptation got laid in his way, and it was uh, I guess it just was too much. Um, Joel's was a more complicated story, um, but he had uh, made himself a fictitious loan, which was a violation of the federal banking laws. And for years, the state had just ignored Citizens Trust Company. They they had unorthodox practices. I, I doubt they were ever examined or ever, because, you know, that's let those guys do what they want. And um, when integration came about, all of a sudden the state got real interested in how the Citizens Trust Bank was run and uh, examined it, and they turned up some stuff that was inappropriate uh, under the banking regulations, and certainly Joel's loan to himself, which he said was a... Um, doc that uh, Mr. Milton had made the loan to, had, had him make the loan in order to buy a site for a branch on the west side that the bank could not buy on its own because it didn't meet the requisite regulatory requirements. Uh, and whether that was true or not, I don't know, but the jury didn't believe him and he ended up in jail, of course. And um, when he came back, he sort of hoped everyone would... Um, just pick up where he'd left off and found that nobody was. His wife divorced him and he, uh, I think, really mm -hmm. died a broken man. It was mm -hmm. a great tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's move to Research Atlanta. And there's another person here who I really think warrants some more attention because he doesn't appear very much in the literature mm -hmm. and it's Rod O'Connor. Oh, yes. Tech. Oh, well, Rod. Rod was a fabulous guy. And, of course, as you know, he's professor of management at Georgia Tech, and he received the highest national 
awards of the country of Colombia and Ecuador for his community revitalization programs that he brought to those countries and ran with great I, I know next to nothing about him, I confess. Yeah. You know, so yeah. just an un- unbelievable story. And uh, at least in Colombia, most of it lost in over time. Um, Georgia Tech always seemed to always have a, a, a South American connection. Oh yeah, and, from way back. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of students came up there. Cuban students and for years and yeah, yeah and Colombia and mm-hmm. Ecuador and other okay, places. That's true. Yeah, that, and that's sort of how Rod got into that. But he he developed a, an approach to community revitalization, which as I recall it, was that you identify successful organizations that have um, have worked and you study why they have been successful rather than just trying to come in with some brand new concept and dropping it down like from out of space and trying to make it work. You built on your successes. <clears throat> and he had pulled together a group and I remember Tom Cousins was in it and Jim Furness from the Great American Mortgage Investors and CNS Bank was in it. Uh, Paul Austin was in it, Coca-Cola. And uh, I don't know whether the first example was Good Government Atlanta or the second example. I remember the Butler Street YMCA was also an early example. And I got invited to participate because of Good Government Atlanta as a model of a successful... Yeah, something that had worked. <laughs> and I um, explained that we had always thought it was going to be a two-pronged effort, that we needed a research arm that was qualified for tax-free treatment because our political activities prohibited us from getting charitable contributions, and that we had anticipated having an organization which we tentatively called Research Atlanta. And the next week, I had a call from uh, Bob Hunter. Bob had been treasurer of Good Government Atlanta, and he worked for Cousins Properties. He was general counsel of Cousins Properties. And uh, he, he said, uh, if uh, Tom were to give you $100,000, could you uh, make it go? And uh, I got together with the group, and we said, well, let's... Let's ask him to give us $33,000 a year for three years, which he agreed to do. And we then went to see Paul Austin and Billy Stern and Bill Bill Van Landingham we had brought in. Bill was the community affairs officer for the CNS Bank, actually, (coughs) and had been largely responsible for the bank's work in Savannah. And Mr. Laney then brought him to Atlanta put him in the same role in Atlanta. That's when CNS Bank had the spring cleaning programs. Do you know about spring cleaning? No, I'm not sure. Incredible. All the CNS Bank employees were mobilized in a spring weekend to go to the west side of Atlanta or maybe to some to the east side and clean up. And they had trucks and they picked up all the trash and all the stuff that had been lying around for years and swept the streets and sidewalks and helped people paint their houses and uh, so on. And they did that more than once. This is Mr. Van Landingham? Or? Well, Bill was in charge of it, but it was a CNS bank-sponsored venture. Hmm. And it uh, was focused on the lower-income parts of the right. city. But Bill, Bill, in event, that was Bill's end of the bank's operations. And uh, we asked him to join the board of Research Atlanta. And uh, we went, I remember Bill and I went to see Mr. Uh, Austin Coca-Cola Company and he said, of course, we'll help. And nobody turned us down. Is Mr. Woodruff still a presence on the scene or is he pretty much faded out by the 70s? I mean, I know by the late 70s he's too... Well, I never met him. Probably about the early 60s, he was still meeting with Mayor Hartsfield, you know, and certainly at the time of the Nobel Peace Prize dinner, he's yep. behind the scenes. But uh, well, I don't think he would have been, other than the Commerce Club board, I don't... 
It's much um, more Paul Austin is taking the lead for the company, yeah. and then people with the various foundations. Yeah. Although, were they established by that time? I don't, or I don't think, think they so. necessarily were. Yeah. I don't know recall that, that they were. In any event, we were able to raise the uh, money, and we um, came up with this novel idea of having a director only serve one or two years, and we were able to recruit Sam Williams, who was, uh, and I remember him and I met, went out to the airport and met uh, Sam and his wife, then wife Sue, as they were on their way to Hilton Head, where the, the um, whatever that company was that ran Hilton Head mm -hmm. Plantations, mm -hmm. Old Head Allen wanted to hire him, and the Frasers, and persuaded him to come to Atlanta, and he did a great job for us. And certainly one of the number of sort of the alumni of Research Atlanta that have gone on to other things, yep. you know, Beth Shapiro, Dick Layton, I was looking yep. at the list. And oh, it's a pretty good list. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that on the board was um, Ben Brown. Yes. And yeah. now Ben, I know had come out of the student movement, but I know was much more of an insider than, say, Julia Bond in that regard, and, you know, it played a different role with the Democratic Party and the state legislature than Julian did and so forth. But I mean, maybe you could speak a little bit about Ben Brown's participation and... You know, I wish I could remember how we found Ben. Um, I may have been through John. John Cox, of course, was on the board initially and was Ben there. Brown also grew up in the Y as yeah. well. Yeah, may well have been. And of course, we all knew who Ben was. and. Uh, well, he was very he was very helpful. He was a pleasant, thoughtful, intelligent guy, and he knew the community. Um, again, the issue of models. You you know you you, I, you say in that report or that history, you were skeptical about a traditional structure for such organizations. So, how did you? I mean, what kind of looking around did you do? What kind of checking out other kinds of similar? Organizations, you know, the whole issue of what this isn't happening in a vacuum. So, well, I think the Community Council of the Atlanta Area Inc. had come apart by then. Um, are you familiar with that? Um, tell me more. This was the Social Service Planning Agency for Metro Atlanta that uh, a fellow named Dwayne Beck was the executive this director of, right. and it was a very powerful. Institution in the community. It's called the Community Council of the Atlanta Area Inc. Yeah. Huh. I saw a reference, but I didn't know what that was exactly. So, well, it was the. It wasn't like exactly. Like the United Way, there were two efforts. They decided they fell out with Beck over whether he got more interested in what kind of carpet he. At least that's what I heard. I did not know firsthand. Right. Uh, and I found that I thought my observation was that uh, nonprofit leaders often got sort of vested in their status over time and went stale. And I won't blame that on any particular one, but I knew there was this one several, yeah. and I uh, thought that that was a problem. And I thought the boards tended to be pretty inactive and just sort of reactive to the direction unless absent a crisis. And so I thought, well, we none of us wanted to be that way. We had all been Fresh. active, working. Mm -hmm. We did our reports at Good Government Atlanta. We didn't have any staff. We did our reports. So um, I came up with the idea that we could attract a more talent. We didn't have much money. And I thought, well, we, we aren't going to be able to hire some established person uh, because we don't have enough money and they're going to be distracted by the size of their office and where it is. And uh, if we hire somebody, this is their first job, and we tell them, we'll introduce you to everybody important in the community, and you'll know Atlanta backwards and forwards, and uh, uh, you you can only serve, I forget whether it's one or two years, and uh, then when you leave, it's clear you weren't fired, We it's, it's the rule, you had to go. Right. Um, 
and uh, we'll help you with it. We'll, we'll be actively involved. We'll read what you write and edit it and introduce you to people and so forth. And uh, that appealed to Sam, and that's exactly how we ran it. And that's exactly how it worked. And then Sam started, uh, came up with some great interns, people working for us for nothing. Dick Layton was one. Dick was from Trinity University in Texas. And mm -hmm. They had a big urban studies right. program, and you could get an internship with an agency, and they'd pay, pay for you. And we had, I think we had more than one person who came to us from uh, Trinity University. And there were still pro programs like CETA, VISTA, I guess, that might have been... Well, I think we had some of that, and we had a few cases where we had a uh, son of a prominent local citizen who had flunked out of school, but was smart, but just wasn't motivated and focused, but liked what we were doing and came to work for us for nothing. And so we, we were able to really turn it out, and Sam did a fabulous job. I graduated from college in 74 from Yale and uh, moved to Atlanta around that time. And, and I just remember both Research Atlanta and other agencies in 52 Fairway Street just teaming with people. There were several people I'd known in college who were working the summer there and that kind of thing, you know, yeah. it was sort of interesting. Um, and we had the happy coincidence that we, when the Action Forum started, Research Atlanta had just started. And one of the very first questions that came up with the Action Forum is, well, fine and dandy for us to get together and talk about this stuff, but where are we going to get the facts? And I was there and said, well, I think Research Atlanta could supply that. And for at least several years, the, the executive director of Research Atlanta was an active ex officio member of the Atlanta Action Forum. I, I, it seemed like there was a very close relationship between those two entities, if I'm not mistaken, right? There was. Um, a question then comes up of um, who's included and who's not. And um, <clears throat> Ben Brown is included, John Cox is included, Joseph Boone is not included, you know, or Jose Williams is not included. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of so where did you draw the line and on what basis or, you know, or how far did you go in terms of that or, or you know, are there people, could have Jose Williams ever have made it in, you know, or a, a Reverend Boone or what have you, you know. Well, I mean, they have a different orientation, I understand, a different approach, a different kind of constituency I, I, and, and so forth. But, well, I, I, I had a point of, of, a point of view on that. And there's that famous Margaret Mead quote, to something to the effect that it's not how many people there are, a few, but people, a few right, dedicated, right. committed That's people the are the only ones that have ever right. accomplished anything. Right. And I guess I felt that the critical thing was to have a group of people who were on the same wavelength, on the same track. And you weren't spending all your time fussing about which way you were going to go on this side or the other. So I essentially was looking for compatible people who I thought were on the same wavelength and who were uh, hopefully enlightened and intelligent and uh, community spirited. Uh, so we would have never added someone who was very different from ourselves for that reason. And I, th I think certainly saw many occasions when organizations sputtered and uh, either collapsed or didn't succeed because they tried to include everybody and all points of view and it didn't get anything done. Didn't, they spent all, they wasted all their time and energy talking about what they were going to do rather than doing something. You know, Father Austin Ford, for instance, would have been a, you know... I, I, I did not agree with Reverend Mr. Ford's philosophy on a lot of matters. And, uh, you know, on the school desegregation, yeah. he, of course, we live, we moved into the E. Rivers District with the view of putting our kids in E. Rivers, and we, unfortunately, our daughter would have started kindergarten the year after they established, not desegregated, but established racial balance in the faculties. Right, right. 
which just tore the school system to pieces. And we had uh, we had a few friends who uh, tried to stick it out who were a little older than we were, and uh, perhaps an amusing story. We one of these couples rented a house on the coast of Maine, and through them we rented the house next door. And they had three children who had a fort on the beach, and we had three children, four, two children with a fort on the beach. And one day I saw this piece of paper in my, in my daughter's handwriting at the age of seven, probably, or eight, mm -hmm. and it said the rules for Ann's fort. And the first rule was, you will not say, and then there was a line of cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, what? Where in the world did she ever even hear these words? We don't use them right. in our family. And I mentioned it to the people next door, and they said, oh, well, yeah. Said those kids from um, Mechanicsville swear like Marine drill sergeants. And our kids picked it all up, and we're terribly sorry. And uh, we hope they'll outgrow it in time, which they did, of course. But. I know Father Ford was involved in getting people up to E Rivers, and, and he he deliberately picked kids from the most depressed, disadvantaged part of Atlanta. Now, my model was Charlie Pepe. You know Charlie? No. He was he was he was the principal at Rivers. No, oh, it, no, he was the principal at the um, oh, Northeast Atlanta School that's still there on Old Ivy Road. It'll come back to me. Okay. Charlie had been a vice president of Riches, and he got religion at some point and decided he wanted to do something for mankind, and he went back and got his education degree, became a teacher and a prin became principal of Sarah Smith School. Sarah Smith, Sarah, yeah. Sarah Smith. And Charlie said, all right, we've got to integrate this school. He got in his car and he drove out to southwest Atlanta. And he drove around in the middle class neighborhoods there and recruited students for his school. And it was much, much more successful than E. Rivers. And the issues, in my view, weren't racial issues. They were class, they were class and the culture. culture. And yeah. And it's just so fast you can push this process. And I think that the doctor, I think the Reverend Mr. I don't know what the Reverend Mr. Ford was trying to accomplish. By trying to make some kind of a point, but it didn't work very well, and it worked much better at Sarah Smith. If I may argue his point without consulting with him, um, <laughs> it seems to me that one point that was being made was that the burden was overwhelmingly on black parents and black children. And so, how do you respond to that? Point? Of of integrating the schools. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was, it was, and. Um, that was also a decision that, the, of course, the Action Forum was instrumental in. Yeah. So let's let's then back up just for a yeah. second and talk about the origins of the Action Forum. I've interviewed Mr. Callaway at one point, but to sort yeah. of talk about sort of how that, how and why that came about. Well, we had that. Uh, yes, it was a very divisive mayor's race, which Sam Sell won uh, with Leroy Johnson. And the business community kind of got bumped out of the cradle in the process because of uh, Rodney Cook. Right, Rodney I Cook, was, the elder. Right. I was I was at City Hall when they had a meeting there in the public auditorium, basically promoting Rodney Cook as the next, and had invited the business leadership of Atlanta. And Mayor Allen was addressing the group, and Sam Massell just walked in from the back and announced he was there. And someone said, well, who invited you? And he said, I invited myself, if I recall. Wow. <laughs> and it was very tense. And it blew, that effort obviously blew up. And uh, Sam, of course, ran a very uh, negative, racially negative campaign. Those ads of the... You're talking about the 73. Was that 73? That's when he ran against Maynard. Oh, that was yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah, All right. Was it? Sorry, I'm, I'm combining them. Yeah. yeah. In any event, he, Sam got elected, the business community kind of got left out. Which and, is 
quite a reversal from the way it had been done forever. Absolutely. They, they were on the outside, and the uh, uh, a lot of the negative things were being said about the community, by the white, by, about Atlanta, by the white business leadership. And uh, the rumors were around that uh, the big insurance companies wouldn't make loans to John Portman to build buildings in downtown Atlanta because of concern about the future of the city. And of course, the banks were all locked in the city limits because of the, the branch banking laws. Right. They were very concerned prior about, to the changes in federal banking. Right. Yeah, whether they were, what their future was. Uh, and I think the. Uh, Forget the name of the African American group that um, Bill Calloway, in any event, was. Empire, Empire Realty, is that? No. Uh, no, this was a community, it was a group of black business leadership that um, basically deputized Bill Calloway to go talk to the white community about getting together to solve the problems. And they chose Mills Lane, interestingly enough, as the most promising prospect for that. When you say interestingly enough? Well, there was the whole fuss with about Dr. King's honorary degree at Yale. I, I don't know that story. Oh, I should know that story. Well, Mr. Just... Lane was a Yale graduate. And uh, sometime in the 60s, Yale gave Dr. King an honorary degree, and Mr. Lane said some very unflattering things about it. and perhaps resigned his uh, position with the Yale Club of Atlanta or said he'd never give money to Yale again or something like that. It was, it was really pretty bad huh. and really quite, quite surprising after looking at how he behaved himself. Otherwise, right. Conducted himself otherwise. But obviously the black community knew he was a positive person in the community on the issue of race. And so Bill went to see him and said, we'd like to, we're all in the same boat. The boat's got a hole in it, and uh, it is, you just can't bail it at one end. we got to work together to keep this place afloat. So, uh, and have you ever seen Bill's own notes on all of that? He did a little piece of sort of a history of the action forum no, that he did himself. I'll try to get you one of those. I think I've got it. <clears throat> um, or if I tell you where it is now, it's in the Georgia State Library because I gave all my right. Atlanta Action Forum papers right. to the library. Right. Uh, so they agreed that they would pick, each pick, I think, six or eight people. The slain white people, uh, Bill, black people. And uh, because they didn't have enough prominent business people in the black side, they could uh, select uh, community leaders, uh, civic organization leaders like Lyndon Wade from the Urban League. And uh, so Mr. Lane picked his people, and uh, obviously Tom Cousins, George, John Portman, Larry Gellerstadt, so forth, and I got picked. And that was... I think that was because of this paper, Atlanta, the next 10 years that I had given to Mr. Lane, or Phil Alston had given to Mr. Lane, uh, shortly before the Action Forum got organized. <clears throat> and John and I were, John Cox and I were appointed the executive secretaries. I guess John was still with the Y at the time, um, as executive of Butler Y. Um, Tom Beebe was unable to participate from Delta, and uh, the man who ran Equifax, then called Retail Credit Company, his name, he was so so the chairman of the Board of Regents, what's his name? Um, I'll remember it, yeah. yeah. And the others are whatever, whoever else appears on the list in the history of the Action mm -hmm. Forum. Mm -hmm. Um, with the idea to do what? Well, the idea was to talk 
the, Ale the this Atlantic Coalition of Current Community Affairs was that the that was the black group that yeah, nominated sure. Bill right, right, yeah, yeah. That, that Bill Calloway I was really hadn't heard of yeah, that, yeah thank you yeah and Mr. Lane was very careful in picking the people that he picked because he said I remember him saying that it'd be a waste of time to add the people from the First National Bank because they weren't wouldn't be interested. I was interested in that already. You know, it seems yeah. CNS takes a large, more commanding role than First Atlanta, you know, First National. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that struck me as being kind of... I don't know whether Ed Smith was president of the bank at that point or not, but Mr. Lane did not feel he would be motivated to meet with the African-American leaders and talk about fixing the problems. So every white person who got picked was someone who he personally thought would relate to the issue and would care about it. And I think part of what happened to the Action Forum over time was that those jobs sort of became, positions became identified with the organizations from which the person came. Uh -huh. And the criteria that you be personally care about the issue and be willing to invest time in it went by the boards. And so the, you ended up with people who took the job, took the position because it was very prestigious in the community. And the other people with the positions were important people, uh, more so than your concern with the problem. And of course it ran out of gas in 30 years, I guess. Now, I'm sure you've read the book Regime Politics by yes. Clarence Stone. Mm -hmm. Now he talked about the action form at some length. Um, I'd be curious to hear your take on that book and then his analysis and his interpretation of Well, I remember thinking he was, I don't remember much of it other than that I thought he was just off base and didn't understand what was going on at all. I think he saw this, if I recall it correctly, as just sort of an exercise of power and influence for the benefit of the organizations and it really wasn't that at all. The, the people were extremely selfless. And I think they saw that in some cases, certainly the banks, because the banks were still locked in to Atlanta, it mattered to the, to the banks what happened within the city of Atlanta. Uh, but uh, if, and John Portman had a big stake, Larry Gellerstadt, they all had stakes, there's no question about that. Well, it's this kind of uh, fusion of one's individual interest and one's community interest, it seems to me, that you, uh, that you these two things are it, it was that, but they were an extraordinarily group of selfless. Yeah, I mean, I'm not disparaging that. I'm saying yeah. you know that they do dovetail. You know that you know you know what's your, in your own self interest is also in the community's interest. You know, and that. Yeah. Um, this, this notion, um, and I saw that one of the first things you were involved. With was MARTA referendum number two. Yep. Yeah. That uh, uh, and the issue there, of course, was the uh, the black community had not supported the first referendum in adequately to carry the day. <coughs> uh, and I think it was partially an exercise of just power. And uh, Leroy Johnson was, as I recall, was the principal spokesman for the. I've forgotten what it's called now, the, the, the truncated line to oh, the yeah. northwest Proctor Atlanta, Creek, the Proctor right, yeah. Creek line, which has, of course, been basically a disaster, and was substituted for the, um, the Marietta uh, Cobb County line that unfortunately never got built. Um, but the, um, the African-American participants made it clear that... Um, uh, they really thought it was a good idea and that we needed the system and that they would like to support it but they needed something they could give to the community as a sign that something had changed that uh, and we talked I remember talking specifically about uh, who would get hired and how, how whether black, African Americans would be welcome as uh, train operators and uh, mechanics and in other jobs and it was um, 
pretty well agreed that there's some parity, there'd be an effort to achieve parity in that. And um, I know Mr. Lane put up some money to um, help um, get out the black vote. Uh, and um, Bottle Street YMCA pitched in to uh, help achieve that. Uh, all informally, of course, but they... Wasn't, wasn't Lyndon Wade, in fact, involved in some of these conversations, too, if I'm not mistaken? I'm not... He may well have... I think he probably was. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Uh, I, you must know Tommy Hills. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. He has been a student of ours at Georgia State uh -huh. recently, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Tommy wrote a paper in one of my classes about sort of the, the early days of MARTA, and I can't remember all the people who he interviewed, but he, he talked with half a dozen people who were in these negotiations and talked yep. about the sort of how it all worked out. And, and what else do you recall about those negotiations and sort of, I mean, it seems like on the one hand, you're kind of building upon relations that have been established and a style of doing things that have been established, but, but clearly the demographics of the city are changing, the political demographics are changing, you're on the eve of uh, black mayors at City Hall and, and these kinds of things. Uh, and there's more of a give and take, you know, whatever one thinks about Stone's book, you know, he does talk about stresses in the coalition and so yeah. forth. Uh, um, so I'd be curious your own memories of, of some of those negotiations around Mara. Well, I think that the... Um Black, black leadership felt that they needed to get more out of MARTA than they had anticipated they would initially. And the Proctor Creek line became sort of the physical evidence Simple. of that. Yeah. But the, the real issue, I think, was the jobs. Well, yeah, I mean, it seems that when you're talking about this interrelated kind of network of things, issues, Jobs probably seem as paramount as 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 uh, housing. You know, uh, when you're talking about what seems to be important at that time. Yeah, my my recollection is that Jesse, who I believe led these discussions within the Action Forum from the African American side, that jobs were the principal issue, and that really was required a commitment of the white participants to who mattered to uh, work toward the opening of employment because I think the Atlanta Transit Authority the company if I recall correctly was not was not well integrated I don't know if there were any black bus drivers about that time I'm not I sure. don't, don't remember any in my rides and I rode the West Peachtree line from downtown and the Buckhead a lot. If there had been, they would have been in black neighborhoods and black roots, but uh, I'm yeah. not sure if there were any by, the, by that time. Yeah. No. No, don't know. Okay. So I think that was, but, and I, but I think that my recollection is that all the white participants were very anxious to have Marta, and they were pragmatic and realistic and accepted the proposition that there needed to be something in this for the African American community, something significant, in return for their support. What about the fact that Mara, of course, only passed in Fulton and DeKalb County? Mm -hmm. Well, there was a lot of racial feeling about it, and the same thing still plagues us to this day of Atlanta being thought of as a, a black community and a lot of people who don't like are fearful of black people or disrespectful of black people or um, well afraid you know yeah all, all those things and it there was of course the Martis said moving Africans through Atlanta right. rapidly or right. something. Yeah. And the whole scare about how blacks were all going to hop on the trains and ride out to your community to do what? I mean, it was it was really absurd. But it was uh, uh, there was a lot of that. 
there was a lot of that. Of course, it was very close. Yeah, I was going to say, you won by a grand total of 500 votes. Yeah, it was very close. Yeah. Which signifies that even within the city, there were deep pockets of opposition as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess Fulton and DeKalb County as well. But, uh, um, well, let's talk, let's move to the schools then. Um, and you could pick up that story. We've been in and out of the schools already a bit. Right. We've talked about desegregation, we've talked about E Rivers. I, I'd be curious about your own involvement with school matters, especially since I gather you said you moved your children to private schools. Yep, they both went to Trinity and then to Westminster, and Bill, our son, ultimately ended up in, um, in the Northeast in prep school. Uh, so I'd be curious about your own sort of why you got involved in schools personally, you know, if your own kids were not in the schools. But second of all, the action forum and the discussions in general about the schools and the compromise in the, the early 70s and Judge Bell and the whole of APS situation in the early 70s. Well, I've always identified with the public schools. I've, I guess I went through a period of time having to defend when I was in college and graduate school and law school that I was a graduate of a public school system in Atlanta, Georgia, for heaven's sakes, and had nothing to apologize for about that. Uh, and my family were educators, of course, and I, of course, went to graduate school thinking I'd become a professor myself. So education has always been very important to us. And uh, part of our lives. And I said, oh, education is the key to the racial problem, that we, we had to find a way to effectively educate all of our kids. And if we didn't, we were going to have real problems. And whether it was crime or uh, cost us uh, welfare or success of our businesses, anything. Mm -hmm. it, well, and it's still true today, of course, even more so today than, than ever. Um, so uh, we had several, I think the after MARTA, I, I think the second topic we talked about at the Action Forum was public schools. And the, uh, the black participants made it clear that Dr. Letson was persona non grata and uh, that they wanted him out of there because felt he had been disrespectful and uh, not interested in their welfare. Um, and of course there were many grievances about the allocation of resources to the schools that indicated that the white schools got the better textbooks earlier and got more support and had better athletic facilities and on and on and on. So um, I think it was agreed that we needed to change and that we needed to find a um, first class superintendent uh, and that the, um, the African Americans basically wanted there to be appointed to every senior position in the school system uh, a, a twin, an African American administrator. Administrator. If it's instruction, there are two. If it's human resources, there are two. So on. Uh, Pete Latimer had been chairman of the Board of Education and uh, resigned as chairman to become the lawyer for the school system. This is before Warren Fortson became lawyer. Yes, right. right. And it was thought, or said, I don't know if it was true, that his the motivation for all that was to fight desegregation in the schools. <clears throat> and of course they fought uh, long and hard. Well, the suit bears his name, Calhoun versus Latimer. Mm -hmm. right here. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to think of the sequence here. Uh, well, because you I'm, say there had been court-ordered racial balance. Yes, that was in the faculty. 
Well, that was for the faculties, not for the students. Okay. There are also various plans out there. There was the ACLU's plan, Marty Pitts Hames, and people like that. There was a regional the, plan. The regional plan, yeah. yeah. Regional plan, which obviously was never going to happen. Um, obviously, it was never going to happen for which reason? Well, the the uh, resistance of the state and the local other local governments and no precedent for it. Plus, it was really pretty unworkable to have transporting kids all over everywhere. It's hard enough to do it in the city of Atlanta, much less on a uh, regional well, basis. Let, let, let that, before we get to this period, let's go back a little bit because <clears throat> we described a situation first desegregation occurred without the confrontation of Little Rock or New Orleans. Right. Nine kids, upper grades alone, handful of kids. Uh, the onus, again, on black parents, black children, and white flight, all informing this, and, a, and Superintendent Letson, sort of all yeah. informing the situation throughout the 1960s. So by the end of the 60s, you have a really different kind of equation than you had, you know, at the beginning of the 60s. Um, and sometimes, I know we're not supposed to ask what if questions, but sometimes I wonder if things had been done earlier or differently. By the end of the 60s, you might have had more options or, you know, more possibilities out there. The Swan case was in Charlotte, yep. and it was the racial balance in the faculty case. And, right. and the uh, the courts saw fit to impose that on the Atlanta public schools, I think, in 69. And the result was that the schools were all completely torn up because you had the, the faculties were about 50-50 black and white. But in the individual schools, there would be a token black and a token white maybe two. So in every school in Atlanta, you had to take out roughly half the teachers who were black and replace them with white teachers and, and you had to say vice versa. They had, a, I think they exempted people who were over 60. Uh, That's really traumatic for the teachers. Oh, you know, it's incredibly traumatic and any sense of, of a functioning faculty course is torn up. And they also changed all the principals around. Wayman Creel, who was the football coach at Northside, whose teams had won the state championship a couple of times in a row, became an assistant coach at a Black High School on the south side of Atlanta. And the um, sure he, were. and he promptly left and went to Lakeside and, and started right. winning championships again. But they were just that, that that happened and it tore the place to pieces and it um, so you didn't have a school that was functioning as a school for several years in any of the, any of them now I guess um, maybe it worked better on the black side of town than on the white side of town maybe maybe not I don't, don't know the answer to that I hope it did but it didn't work very well at some the point in there, our, our friend Judge Bell enters the fray again. Well, they were still, the, the desegregation case was still going on. And uh, Lonnie King was president of the Atlanta branch of NAACP, and John Cox and Jesse Hill and others were on the board. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know how it happened, but Judge Bell got invited to an Action Forum meeting. This is pretty unusual for a sitting Federal Circuit Court of Appeals judge to come to discuss in private an issue that's pending before the courts. I'd say yes. But Judge Bell was a practical man and he had great confidence in the integrity of what he was doing. I think he was correct. And he basically said, this case is a disgrace to Atlanta. He said, this is the longest running school desegregation case in the United States. A city that seems it's too busy to hate, where black folks and white folks get along, and we have not settled this case. And it 
needs to be settled. And you need to get it settled. You, the action forum. Yeah. And uh, Lonnie was participating in the action forum, and <clears throat> he took it to heart, and he uh, negotiated hard to uh, with the school system. Uh, and my friend Jerry Luxemburg was then on the board. Jerry was a good government Atlanta member who was elected. He's gone way back to the Crime Commission, right? Yeah, yeah. To, from the Crime Commission. And uh, uh, I guess, I don't know if Tom Beebe was still on. He may have been, he, he resigned when um, he was elected CEO of Delta, and I think maybe Frank Smith took his place initially. Any event, they negotiated a settlement, which was this settlement and uh, presented it to the court. And the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund said, hell no, uh, we want a regional plan. And uh, Lonnie said, well, and uh, Mr. King doesn't speak for the NAACP, and uh, they fired uh, Lonnie, and John and Jesse were all suspended, I believe, from their positions. I think the and, branch was yeah. punished too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Lonnie said, well, sorry, Your Honor, these people don't represent the plaintiffs. I personally represent the plaintiffs. I hold the power of attorney in the plaintiffs in this case, not the NAACP. And <laughs> that was true. He had personally had the powers of attorney to represent the, the parents who were the plaintiffs in the case. So 18 years after the original suit had been uh, yeah. filed. And oh. how that happened, I have no That's idea. That's an interesting question. Yeah. But in any event, out goes the NAACP in a unhappy mood, shall we say. And the case gets settled because Lonnie has the power to approve the settlement. That's and the, the court's accepted it. That's the short version of the story. Mm -hmm. um, can we tell some more about that process? You know? I don't. I don't know more about it. Okay. I, I just uh, and Lonnie's told me that, and I think somebody ought to ask him. Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> next time I see Lonnie, I'm yeah. gonna ask him. Yeah. Um, it does get to a larger question before we go back to the schools about you know both the degree of to which black or white members of Action Forum had common goals and to which the degree to which the goals were distinct. And maybe you could speak to that. I'm reminded of a case from the 50s, actually, when George Goodwin is driving around with Bob Thompson of the Urban League. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're looking at land to open up in the west side of town. And Thompson turns to Goodwin and says, you're doing this to keep a lid on the city, and I'm doing it for the liberation of my people. Mm -hmm. But they were both in sort of lockstep Mm -hmm. With the same, you know, specific objective. Yeah. So, I'd be curious as to your thoughts about, again, to what degree did folks on both sides of the color line have things in common in terms of aims and approaches and so forth? And what to what degree would you say the the goals might have been different, if at all? Well, there were the natural uh, differences from uh, status and position. And, by, and well-being, I guess, is really the word I would, would use. So that we, there were periodic flare-ups, I guess I would call it, of, the, of some of the African-American participants basically wanting to focus almost ex exclusively on affirmative action mm -hmm. for improvement of their and their people's economic mm -hmm. position and mm -hmm. status. And the, um, I think the action forum ultimately f fell apart over that. That, that issue subsumed everything else or clipped everything it else? It just kept the, the, in the latter 90s going into the 2000s, the, uh, Maynard had become the black co-chair. And I think 
as much as I admire Maynard and what he was able to accomplish, I think that was probably a mistake for the action form because Maynard was a political person, obviously a very successful one, and he had a very strong commitment to affirmative action. It's the defining moment of his term. Yeah. And it um, uh, and it kept coming up, and I'm quite confident that the white members had been warned by their lawyers that they should not discuss their own affirmative their company's affirmative action programs and policies and so forth. And so they started drifting away. Of course, there were changes. There were new people in many cases without the same roots and with different yeah. agendas. The, the what had been local organizations were now national and international organizations, right, sure. and these fellows had not the same. Very different perspective. And so they lost, I think they lost interest. And in the end, you had Pete Carell kept coming, Charlie Loudermilk kept coming, mm -hmm. Sam Williams kept coming. I was usually there. Uh, we had a Christmas, we'd always had a Christmas party, which was uh, with, the, with the spouses. And they were really nice affairs, formal affairs mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. At the Commerce Club, they all signed Christmas carols, uh, Great. Yeah. told stories. Terrific. And yeah. it was a social uh, meeting of the black and white leadership that had never really occurred before. And I think was probably important. Uh, but the last party was at the Governor's Mansion, Roy Barnes was the host, and I think three or four white people showed up. It was really quite dis distressing. Um, and then it was decided, well, we might need this thing again someday, so let's put it on hold for emergencies. And uh, Maynard and John Cox then called me and asked me if I'd come to Maynard's office to meet. And this was early seven, early 2000s. And said, look, we, we really need to revive this thing. We need to get it active again. And uh, I said, I think this is going to be very difficult because I think this emphasis on Affirmative action as opposed to community issues generally, with affirmative action being a subset of that, is uh, going to be hard to pull off. And then um, we had another meeting, and a very fine fellow from Georgia Power, who was their local community affairs guy. That's Jim Davis. No, no after Jim Davis. It was, yeah. No, this was after Jim Davis. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's a Morehouse graduate. I know okay. his name so well, I can't think of it. Was there, and he said that David Radcliffe thought it is was important to try to revive it. And um, how would we go about doing that? I said, well, the guy who's the white co-chairman is Gary Thompson who was the head of Wachovia in Georgia, I think. He succeeded Joe Pendergast. Joe had been very active, mm -hmm. very fine guy, great contributor, mm -hmm. very wonderful guy, very public-spirited. And uh, said, I said, so I think you got to get Gary to agree Either you got to call the whole group together and have them elect somebody else, or you got to get Gary to step aside. And they asked me if I would take that on, and I said, "Well, I, I won't. I, I tell you what, I will do. If David will say that he would like the job, I would be surprised if Gary wouldn't be happy to give it up." This is David Radcliffe, who was. President of Georgia Power, oh, yeah. now President of Southern Company. Right. And uh, so the word came back, Art, 
Hart is the guy, first name of the guy. Okay. George Power. Starts with an M. Okay. M something. Um, that uh, David would like to take it over, and would I please call Gary, which I did, and Gary said, sure, if David would like to do it, I'd be happy not to do it. And uh, so David then added some new members, basically going back to the same organizations that had, had leadership in it before, but some new people. Remember the fellow from Russell, the big uh, athletic equipment mm -hmm. uh, uh, attire right. guy was, was there. Uh, and Phil Jacobs was there from AT&T, but they'd always, Sit Bell South had always been in it. Sure. And I guess maybe he was from Bell South in those days. Right. Uh, and there were probably three or four meetings, one Christmas party, and uh, there just weren't any more meetings. And I don't know, I don't think it had been after the initial meeting uh, well attended and just petered out. Maynard died in 2003 and... Yeah, um, yeah. But this, happened, this, this went on for another couple of years. It really didn't get revived till after Maynard died. Uh -huh. It really didn't get revived. Bill Clement mm -hmm. took Maynard's place. Maynard's brother-in-law or something. Cousin, I think. Cousin, yeah. yeah. I think he's a cousin. Um, any event, that's the end of it. The end of action for him. Yeah. Um, let me... Mm -hmm. We could do two things. We could either continue, we've gone over two hours, um, or we could break now and resume. I would love to do a second interview if that were okay. Um, I still have lots of things I want to talk about, yeah. and uh, we've only scratched the surface, but is that would that be sure. within the realm of possibility? Sure, I know that give you a chance to uh, gather your thoughts.